Hi to everyone. First, allow me. Is it okay? Can you hear me? First, allow me to uh, thank uh, the people who made my presentation here possible. Uh, it's a great pleasure to to speak at the conference uh, on the history of Turkish Republic, uh, organized by the Sabanja Center for Turkish Studies uh, at Colombia. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Professor Zeynep Çelik and Tunç Sen for, for inviting me to the Centennial Conference. Uh, and uh, many thanks in advance to Nuket for commenting my paper. I am sure that her comments, uh, ah, you are here. Uh, I'm sure that her comments and your comments will help my paper to go forward. To, to, uh, I will be able to improve it. Uh, I'm also grateful to Ipek Cem Taha that I met this morning, and I understand that it's thanks to her that our, my presence in this room was uh, possible, uh, and uh, her uh, him, herself and uh, Arara Çekercian, who, who, who kindly helped me in getting the U.S. visa in time. And <laughs> so thank you very much, Arara. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I would uh, like to introduce my presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, first introduce the institutions and the people, the actors, who played a crucial role in the emergence of scientific research in early decades of the Republic. In one part, you have the uh, institutions here, who I will talk about them later on, and these are the uh, some of the uh, assets of the people and their uh, diploma they received from European and American universities. Uh, my point is, I don't know whether you will accept it or not, uh, is that a scientific revolution occurred in Turkey in the early Republican period, thanks to Atatürk's vision and foresight. I intentionally use the term revolution, debrim, instead of reform, uslahat. First, because the term revolution has a more profound meaning than the reform, uh, which is commonly used to denote the Atatürk debrim levy in English. Secondly, because I believe that it fits better, the term revolution fits better when science is on the agenda. Uh, when speaking of scientific revolution, uh, it is usually the 16th century European scientific <laughs> revolution that comes into mind. Uh, but the, the Republic's scientific revolution is somewhat different than the 16th century uh, revolution because uh, it did not bring uh, radical changes in the scientific code as it was the case in the 16th century scientific revolution. Uh, you know, uh, at, uh, at the 16th century revolution, the Aristotelian views were replaced by Copernican uh, views uh, when uh, astronomy uh, when you speak of astronomy, the ge geocentric um, uh, system of the universe was replaced by the heliocentric system. But even so, I believe that the many radical changes and novelties observed in the science policy during the early decades of the Republic can be considered as a scientific revolution. Uh, I want to name some of these radical changes. Uh, so I have to. Uh, for example, research institutions were established by the state and they were mandated to conduct research by law. Scientific, scientific knowledge was produced within Turkish institutions. Scholarship students that I will uh, introduce them uh, to you later on, uh, were sent by the state to study exact sciences and engineering to top European and American universities. 
Another uh, change is that the, a scientific method in research was implemented. I mean, uh, this scientific method was a main constituent of the uh, 16th century European scientific revolution. This scientific method is based on measurement, observation, experimentation, and uh, experience. Uh, if scientific journals were launched in Turkey, PhD theses were prepared in Turkish institutions by Turkish researchers. And uh, also women became part of the scientific uh, and academic life. In short, the above changes uh, I listed uh, about and the novelties led to the emergence of scientific research in Turkey in the early Republican period. And I believe that this scientific revolution should be cited among the many revolutions, devrim or reforms that Atatürk initiated in economy, in law, in social life and in education. So this is my point. We, we can discuss it later. So what I will do is to present the actors uh, based on the archives of, uh, of, the, of the families, uh, family archives. And I have also photographs from the institutions where, uh, who, which witness that uh, research were done in laboratories. Let's start. Uh, so a perfect vision of science uh, is that he was convinced that scientific research was essential for the progress of a nation, if made by its own institutions and researchers. Scientific knowledge was present before the uh, Republican period in the Ottoman Empire. I don't deny that, that uh, this scientific knowledge in the Ottoman times were mostly important either from medieval Islam or uh, 19th century uh, European science books. But he had in mind that scientific research has to be done in Turkey by Turkish researchers. And uh, that's why in the Republican period, uh, the state invested in research institutions. There were institutions and laboratories in the Ottoman period, I don't deny it, there were uh, laboratories of uh, anti rabi but, but their, um, laboratory founded by Zohar Ospasha. Uh, there were laboratories in hospitals, in customs. Uh, but these were laboratories for making analyses. And the, uh, uh, the methods they used were imported from uh, European textbooks. There were also the, the observatory of Takuitin, no doubt. Uh, Takuitin made significant observations about it, but it had no continuity afterwards. So uh, uh, I think that this making research in Turkish institutions was a unprecedented enterprise in Turkey's history. Uh, so uh, for uh, for the evaluation of scientific knowledge in the Ottoman time, I just called Adnan Adıvar, uh, who was uh, a prestigious uh, historian of science of the early uh, 20th century. He published La Science chez les Turcs Ottoman uh, in, in Paris, then later on in, in Turkish in Turkey. And he says that uh, the, let me, read it, I'm sorry, I cannot have my <laughs> presentation under my eyes. Uh, uh, the exact science in Ottoman Turkey were in fact a deficient and erroneous continuation of the science written in Arabic and Persian languages. It is neither different in method nor in content from the sciences shaped in the East after the reception of the Greek miracle. So uh, this uh, argument was much discussed uh, in Turkey when the book was published in, in Turkish, but 
Anyway, I don't want to uh, uh, waste more time on it. But what I want to say that uh, making a scientific revolution was in the mind of Atatürk before the proclamation of the Republic, because he, uh, he made a speech uh, in the uh, first um, Congress of Education. And I want to quote, he said, I have no doubt that our nation, who is obliged to combat not only with its weapons, but with its brain, demand, will succeed in both battles. So this was in 1921. And after making his speech, he went to, to, to the uh, battlefield. At that time, the Greeks were approaching Ankara. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, I want to skip because I told you beforehand that they were, the actors were Turkish scholarship students. They were uh, also uh, European scholars who taught in uh, Turkish institutions in university. Yes, European uh, personalities were in the mortar of Turkish Republic. Uh, I, so, uh, I mentioned also the uh, PhD thesis. And you ha have here the uh, scholarship students in Göttingen in 1937. Uh, you have uh, Jahid Art and, and other celebrities in the picture. And this is the uh, Department of Pharmaco uh, Pharmacodynamics where Kulevka, the head, is make, conducting research with an assistant in 1930s. So the first, let's start with the actors and I will move on to the institutions. But uh, both projects uh, uh, run concurrently. So the Turkish, the first, um, Context exam was organized in 1924, and students were sent to uh, mostly to uh, France, to Paris, to study social science, music, and plastic arts. And uh, the first group was sent by the Ministry of Education, but later on, many other uh, institutions sent their own scholarship students like Sumer Bank, Eti Bank, uh, other ministries as well. Uh, and uh, they were uh, in newspaper, you have announcements and people would uh, apply and there was an examination and the best one would uh, send to, to Europe first until the second world war two. So this is the first group on the, on the uh, left-hand side, you see the first group, uh, two uh, paint, uh, famous paintings, uh, Mahmoud Juda and Cevap Dereli, are in Académie Julian in Paris with a new, new. Uh, and the second group in 1929, these, uh, these students were, sent mostly to study exact sciences. You have among them also Jahid Arp. And this is from the archive of Gülfeza Arma. Um, he studied uh, mathematics in Lyon, but, uh, and then after coming home, she, she worked as a mathematics teacher in Erankoy High School. So these are on board of a, a ship Brasilia, Brazil. <laughs> Uh, who took them to Marseille from Athens. So in 1929, there was an e economic crisis that emerged from this city. So uh, the, as the German industry, uh, Germans had built their industry with the money they took from, the, from America, the German industry collapsed. And with that, uh, Turkish pound became stronger than the German one. So now it's the reverse. But in any case, this is this was the case. And you know well, Ekrem Asurgal, the archaeologist, he recalls that the scholarship provided to Turkish students allowed me to live like princes. 
I also dine in prestigious restaurants such as Kempinski and Mampe in Berlin. In addition to my daily attire and uh, short sleeve, I had a tailcoat and a tuxedo. So they are very chic photo of Ekrem Akurgal taken in, in parties in Berlin. So these are uh, other uh, Jale Inan, also the archaeologist. Uh, he, he was not a scholarship student. He was sent by Humboldt uh, uh, to, to Berlin. So they are very happy and they are uh, playing petanque in, uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, in pre-war students, uh, in pre-war uh, Germany, they were uh, students uh, who studied many, many different various disciplines. But I have some photos from, uh, from engineering. Some uh, studied forestry uh, in Berlin. And it's interesting, uh, from 15 students uh, sent to Germany uh, to study forestry engineering, 13 returned home with PhD thesis. And uh, these are the cartographers, to be cartographers. And when, when they come back, they made a wonderful job. They uh, made the trigonometrical survey of Turkey. Before that, there were no trigonometrical survey in Turkey, uh, and, but some uh, foreign uh, European engineers did some work. So uh, it was not only engineering, but geology, uh, zoology, and, uh, and other sciences, natural sciences were studied by Turkish students. I, I put uh, here uh, Professor Isan Ketin as an example. You may know him because he is the discoverer of the Anatolian uh, fault line. This is the fault line. Uh, the article was published in, in Germany in 1948. He studied uh, Bonn uh, and made his PhD in Bonn as well and returned home just before the Second World War. And uh, thereafter, in 1939, this, there was the big, big Anatolian earthquake, Erzincan earthquake in Istanbul. And he went on the field and studied the fault lines created by the, by the earthquake. So, uh, uh, obviously, the, the Turkish students witnessed the rise of Nazism in Germany. They, are, uh, they, uh, they tell about it in, often in their uh, memories. Uh, some of them, uh, let's go, uh, these are the students uh, who, who studied in the uh, in Zurich in uh, in the ETH? Uh, uh, this is a big photograph who um, witnessed that students loved very much Atatürk. But in every room they hired during their studies, you have a photo of Atatürk. Well, the rise of Nazism uh, led. Uh, let me go back. Uh, uh, brought instability uh, in the projects of Turkish students. Uh, because uh, when a uh, few days before the World War II began, the Turkish embassy sent, sent uh, let's say, um, announcement to Turkish students and ask them to leave uh, Germany and to return uh, home. Some of them uh, returned home, but others stayed in, in Germany to continue their studies. Those who returned home to Istanbul, the, uh, the government, Turkish government, decided to uh, send them to the United States. And this uh, be, maybe it's the beginning of the rush uh, towards the United States uh, uh, in, in, in 1939, in 1940. So uh, many students uh, were sent to, to Athens and then they took the very luxurious transatlantic Mea Hellas. Uh, they went to New York in 20 uh, days and some of them were sent to the Michigan University, others uh, 
were uh, disseminated towards uh, in, in other universities. And uh, they recall that the students who embarked uh, in New York were sent, were taken by other Turkish students to the 48th Street where they were Greek restaurants and Greek uh, speaking, uh, uh, Turkish speaking Greek people. So this was the, their first experience with the city of New York. So one of them uh, who had, uh, this is Bahiasos, I met, I was, uh, I met him personally, uh, studied one year in Germany, then came to, um, to the United States with the, this Nea Hellas, and he was graduated uh, as a metallurgy engineer in Montana School of Mines, and then made his uh, MSc thesis at MIT. And these are the other people who made their thesis at MIT in 1944. So uh, these people, uh, after returning home, dedicated their life to the improvement development of the Turkish industry. Uh, in 1940, I, uh, I have a few minutes, no, I have seven minutes left. Uh, in 1940, the MTA, uh, the Institute for Mineral Research, uh, discovered petroleum in Turkey, in Rama. And they uh, announced this discovery to, to the Turkish uh, students in, in uh, in the United States, and they said those who are um, studying geology on, or mining, please go and study petroleum engineering. And uh, they became the first petroleum engineering of Turkey, these guys. So when they went to Turkey, they had to uh, work as sondage drilling uh, engineers at Raman in the dust of the in, in, the, in the tents and so on. So this was a group. So these are uh, another group of uh, geology and uh, petroleum engineers, mining engineers who, who studied at Oklahoma University uh, at the end of the World War, during the World War II. Uh, this is, so I have little time left, so I go very quickly. This is Teti uh, Kadesh uh, from Cornell University, from six uh, undergraduate students at Cornell, and then MS, MSc students at Syracuse University. So going back during the uh, first, the Second World War II, especially at the end of the Second World War II, was not easy uh, because uh, of the German uh, attacks. So there were liberty ships who took the Turkish students <coughs> to Turkey, but they would tra uh, travel across the ocean guided by uh, destroyers and aircraft carriers and so on. And uh, vice versa, traveling from Istanbul uh, to, to the States was not uh, easy because there were no ships crossing the ocean. Uh, liberty ships could only take 12 students and uh, some liberty ships took students from Istanbul to, um, to the States. Two students um, traveled in the ironclad Missouri that, uh, which took the remains of Munir Ertegun to Istanbul, the, the, um, the United States uh, ambassador. And finally, the, there were so many students that gathered in Istanbul waiting for, uh, to travel. Uh, the government bought a ship. This is the bucket, the copper, this copper. Uh, they bought the ship and repaired it and put in the uh, 120, 110 uh, students and they uh, sent them to the United States to further their study. Uh, of course, there are uh, professors who taught in uh, Turkish institutions, and they were also crucial in teaching modern sciences and also teaching how to make research. Uh, to, uh, but uh, this 
group was uh, much studied, so I, I want to, uh, to, skip, uh, to skip them, uh, not because the uh, contribution was low, but uh, we have, uh, I have less time. But among them were Finde Freundi. He, he was a research uh, companion of Albert Einstein. And uh, physicists stayed uh, shorter time in, in Istanbul because they didn't found the, the appropriate technical equipment so that they could do research. But uh, natural historians, the zoologists, uh, Kurt Kospik and Andre Heilbronn, they say, more longer because the fauna and the flora of Anatolia was very rich and they could conduct research in Turkey. Oh, uh, let's uh, move to institutions. I would be brief, but let me say that three main research institutions were uh, established in Ankara uh, in 1930s. The first one was the Central Institute for Hygiene, the Big Saitam Hygiene Institute. It's closed now. Uh, this is the, 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 the photo uh, about. The five is uh, with, with laboratories. These uh, research uh, institutions has had many laboratories and they use these laboratories for research. But this uh, institute also produced serums and vaccines. Uh, the uh, Higher Institute of uh, Agriculture, uh, which also opened at the same year of the Turkish University, uh, of Istanbul University, uh, it, it was directed, managed by, by a, a professor, German professor, uh, but uh, this was not a refugee scholar. This was a scholar sent by the uh, Third Reich. Uh, so this was a Nazi professor, but anyway, they were refugee professors and, and those sent by the Third Reich uh, in Ankara and Istanbul as well. And uh, they started uh, in the early years of the establishment to uh, conduct PhD and habilitation thesis. Habilitation is, is uh, kind of uh, easy to become associate professor. And Arif Atman, a professor at the, this institute, and he is the founder of winemaking, enology in, in Turkey, said uh, before the Institute of Agriculture, there were no scientific research in, in, in the institute or even in Turkey, because when we needed uh, scientific knowledge, we have to rely on foreign uh, literature and uh, from we would uh, take the, the scientific uh, results of the scientific research done in Europe. So the Institute of Mineral Research, the, the second important uh, research institute, this is the headquarters, this is the, uh, they built the first oil uh, refinery in Turkey. They produced uh, more than 500 geological maps of Turkey. You have the plate Izmir Paktasa here. And uh, during these uh, field activities, you now see women researchers in MSA. This is Mehlika Tashman. Uh, examining the paleontological specimens that were excavated on the field. Oh, uh, yes, uh, I have to say a few words uh, about these uh, seed breeding institutions, because um, besides the three many big research institutions, there were small stations where uh, agricultural research was conducted. And the uh, people were trying to produce um, quality seeds and uh, disease resistant seeds to distribute to the farmers. And this, the, the uh, Eskishayir Satova station is the first of, of, of these stations. And you see a, a photo, uh, a, a young person um, performing cross feeding process. This is the aerial, aerial photograph. This is the main building, and this is Sarkat 52, 
one of the breeds uh, produced in there. And in that, uh, interestingly, uh, one year later or two years later, a, a dry farming institute was established in Eskishehir, and the director was Ali Numan Kuraj. You know who is Ali Numan Kuraj? He, he is uh, the husband of uh, Vehbi uh, Koch's daughter. So he was sent to uh, Kansas University, graduated from the College of Agriculture, and then graduated from the Nebraska University. And this is the laboratory of the dry farming station at Eskishev. So, so these are PhD students. Just a, a, a slide on how research uh, gained, uh, increased uh, after 1939, when the uh, META, the Mineral Research Institute, was established and launched its own journal. So this is the journal, and this is the graphic, and uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, this is from 1908 to 1965, and the research starts increasing in 1935-57. So there is a, a peak at 1954. I don't know why there is a peak. I have to, to look after it. I, I was not able to find why. Uh, so this, I think this is my last slide. Uh, I think that uh, this is, let me present Javi Terginsoy. Uh, uh, he has his PhD uh, in uh, 1982 at Queen Mary College London. He has been a senior scientist at the Brookhaven Nation Laboratory. He worked on theoretical physics. And you may know well uh, Feza Gursay, who had uh, his uh, PhD in physics in Imperial College of London. There are also uh, scholars students in the in the uh, in England, uh, in in Switzerland, in in many other countries. And he was also in Brookhaven National Laboratory and visiting professor at Columbia University. Uh, so uh, to conclude, I want to say that these scholarship students, this is a project that Asli Tolun uh, started in uh, 2007. And then I became part of the project later on. And we are still dwelling with the biography of so many people who studied uh, uh, in Europe and in the States before 1950. Uh, I hope we will publish the first uh, volume uh, next year. Uh, but uh, my conclusion is this, that these young people who went to the European or American universities, uh, they, uh, upon their return, they do not only bring with them scientific knowledge of the time, but they uh, come home uh, and uh, when they come home, they knew uh, how to make scientific research. I mean, they were, um, let me find the right word uh, to conclude. So uh, they were back with a profound understanding of the scientific method, how to generate new knowledge, which was crucial for conducting research. And uh, so these people with the establishment of state research institution, they paved the way for the emergence of scientific revolution in the early republic. And I think that the scientific revolutions should be listed among the, I, I repeat that, among the other revolution made by Atatürk, like Shabka Devine or uh, educational reform, uh, reform in economy, so on. Thank you for... Uh, uh,